Chapter Seven of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Persecution in the Offing. Next morning, as Jucundus was dusting and polishing his statues and other articles of taste and devotion, supplying the gaps in their ranks and grouping a number of new ones which had come in from his workmen, Juba strutted into the shop and indulged himself from time to time in an inward laugh or snigger at the various specimens of idolatry which grinned or frowned or frisked or languished on all sides of him don't sneer at that anubis said his uncle it is the work of the divine callista that i suppose is why she brings into existence so many demons answered juba nothing more can be done in the divine line like the queen who fell in love with a baboon now i come to think retorted jucundus that god of hers is something like you she must be in love with you juba the youth as was usual with him tossed his head with an air of lofty displeasure at length he said and why should she not fall in love with me pray why because you are too good or too bad to need her plastic hand she could not make anything out of you non ex quovis ligno but she'd be doing a good work if she wiled back your brother he does not want wiling any more than i said juba i dare say he's no christian what's that said his uncle looking around at him in surprise agellius no christian not a bit of it answered juba rest assured i taxed him with it only last night let him alone he'll come round he's too proud to change that's all preach to him entreat him worry him try to turn him work at the bit whip him and he will turn restive start aside or run away but let him have his head pretend not to look seem indifferent to the whole matter and he will quietly sit down in the midst of your images there callista has an easy task she'll bribe him to do what he would else do for nothing the very best news i have heard since your silly old father died cried jucundus the very best if true juba i'll give you a handsome present the first sow your brother sacrifices to ceres ha ha what fine fun to see the young farmer over his cups at the nundine ha ha no christian bravo juba ha ha i'll make you a present i say an apollo to teach you manners or a, a mercury to give you wit that's quite true said juba he would not be thinking of callista if he were thinking of his saints and angels ha, ha, to be sure returned jucundus to be sure yet why shouldn't he worship a handsome greek girl as well as any of those mummies and death's heads and bogies of his which i should blush to put up here alongside even of anubis or a scarabius her mother thinks she is not altogether the girl you take her for said his nephew no matter no matter answered jucundus no matter at all she may be a laius or a phryne for me the sure to make a man of him <laughs> why said juba mother thinks her head is turning in the opposite way you see strange isn't it he added annoyed himself yet not unwilling to annoy his uncle hm exclaimed jucundus making a wry face and looking round at him as if to say what on earth is going to turn up now to tell the truth said juba gloomily i did once think of her myself i don't see why i have not as much right to do so as agellius if i please so i thought old mother might do something for me and i asked her for a charm or love potion which would bring her from her brother down to the forest yonder goethe took to it kindly for she has a mortal hatred of callista because of her good looks though she won't say so and because she's a greek she liked the notion of humbling the haughty minx so she began one of the most tremendous spells he shrieked out with a laugh one of the most tremendous spells in her whole budget all and everything in the most exact religious way wine milk 
blood meal wax old rags gods numidian as well as punic such names one must be barbarian to boot as well as wit to pronounce them a score of things there were besides and then to see the old woman with her streaming gray hair twinkling eyes and grim look twirl about as some flute girl at a banquet it was enough to dance down not only the moon but the whole milky way but it did not dance down callista at which mother got savage and protested that callista was a christian jucunda looked much perplexed medius phidias he said why unless we look sharp she will be converting him the wrong way and he began pacing up and down the small room juba on his part began singing gerda the witch would have pardon in the jest though lame as a gull by his highness possessed she shouldered her crutch and danced with the rest sporting and snorting deep in the night their beards flashing fire and their hoofs striking light and their tails whisking round in the heat of their flight by this time jucundus had recovered from the qualm which juba's intelligence had caused him he cried out cease your rubbish old goethe's jealous i know her spite christian is the most blackguard word in her vocabulary it's barber for toad or adder i see it all no callista the divine callista must take in hand this piece of wax sing a charm and mould him into a vertumnus she'll show herself the more potent witch of the two the new emperor too will help the incantation what something is coming asked juba with a grin coming boy yes i warrant you answered his uncle we'll make them squeak if gentle means don't do then we'll just throw in another ingredient or two an axe or a wild cat or a firebrand take care what you are about if you deal with agellius said juba he's a sawney but you must not drive him to bay don't threaten keep to the other line he's weak-hearted only has a background to bring out the painting the muse singing all in light relieved by sardix or sepia it must come but perhaps agellius will come first it was indeed as jucundus had hinted a new policy a new era was coming upon christianity together with the new emperor christians had hitherto been for the most part the objects of popular fury rather than of imperial jealousy nero indeed from his very love of cruelty had taken pleasure in torturing them but statesmen and philosophers though at times perplexed and inconsistent yet on the whole had despised them and the superstition of priests and people with their christianos ad leones had been the most formidable enemy of the faith accordingly atrocious as the persecution had been at times it had been conducted on no plan and had been local and fitful but even this trial had been suspended with but few interruptions during the last thirty nay fifty years so favourable a state of things had been more or less brought about by a succession of emperors who had shown an actual leaning to christianity while the vigorous rule of the five good emperors as they are called had had many passages in its history of an adverse character those who followed after being untaught in the traditions and strangers to the spirit of old rome foreigners or adventurers or sensualists were protectors of the new religion the favourite mistress of commodus is even said to have been a christian so is the nurse of caracalla the wretched heliogobalus by his taste for oriental superstitions both weakened the influence of the established hierarchy and encouraged the toleration of a faith which came from palestine the virtuous alexander who followed him was a philosopher more than a statesman and in pursuance of the syncretism which he had adopted placed the images of abraham and our lord among the objects of devotion which his private chapel contained what is told us of the emperor philip is still more to the point the gravest authorities report that he was actually a christian and since it cannot be doubted that christians were persuaded of the fact the leaning of his government must have been emphatically in their favour to account for such a belief in consequence 
Christians showed themselves without fear, they emerged from the catacombs and built churches in public view, and though in certain localities, as in the instance of Africa, they had suffered from the contact of the world, they spread far and wide, and faith became the instrument at least of political power, even where it was wanting in charity, or momentarily disowned by cowardice. In a word, though Celsus a hundred years before had pronounced a man weak who should hope to unite the three portions of the earth in a common religion, that common Catholic faith had been found, and a principle of empire was created which had never before existed. The phenomenon could not be mistaken, and the Roman statesman saw he had to deal with a rival. Nor must we suppose, because on the surface of the history we read so much of the vicissitudes of imperial power, and of the profligacy of its possessors, that the fabric of government was not sustained by traditions of the strongest temper, and by officials of the highest sagacity. It was the age of lawyers and politicians, and they saw more and more clearly that if Christianity was not to revolutionize the empire, they must follow out the line of action which Trajan and Antoninus had pointed out. Decius then had scarcely assumed the purple when he commenced that new policy against the church, which was reserved to Diocletian fifty years later, to carry out to its own final refutation. He entered on his power at the end of the year 249, and on the January 20th following, the day on which the church still celebrates the event, St. Fabian, bishop of Rome, obtained the crown of martyrdom. He had been pope for the unusually long space of fourteen years, having been elected in consequence of one of those remarkable interpositions of divine providence of which we now and then read in the first centuries of the church. He had come up to Rome from the country in order to be present at the election of a successor to Pope Anteros. A dove was seen to settle on his head, and the assembly rose up and forced him, to his surprise, upon the episcopal throne. After bringing back the relics of St. Pontian, his martyred predecessor from sardinia and having become the apostle of great part of gaul he seemed destined to end his history in the same happy quiet and obscurity in which he had lived but it did not become a pope of that primitive time to die upon his bed and he was reserved at length to inaugurate in his own person as chief pastor of the church a fresh company of martyrs suddenly an edict appeared for the extermination of the name and religion of christ it was addressed to the proconsuls and other governors of provinces and alleged or implied that the emperors decius and his son being determined to give peace to their subjects found the christians alone an impediment to the fulfilment of their purpose and that by reason of the enmity which those sectaries entertained towards the gods of rome an enmity which was bringing down upon the world multiplied misfortunes desirous then above all things of appeasing the divine anger they made an irrevocable ordinance that every christian without exception of rank sex or age should be obliged to sacrifice those who refused were to be thrown into prison and in the first instance submitted to moderate punishments if they conformed to the established religion they were to be rewarded if not they were to be drowned burned alive exposed to the beasts hung upon the trees or otherwise put to death this edict was read in the camp of the praetorians posted up in the capital and sent over the empire by government couriers the authorities in each province were themselves threatened with heavy penalties if they did not succeed in frightening or tormenting the christians into the profession of paganism st fabian as we have said was the first fruits of the persecution and eighteen months passed before his successor could be appointed in the course of the next two months st peonius was burned alive at smyrna and st nestor crucified in pamphylia at carthage some perplexity and delay were occasioned by the absence of the proconsul st cyprian its bishop took advantage of the delay and retired into a place of concealment the populace had joined with the imperial government in seeking his life and had cried out furiously in the circus demanding him ad leonem for the lion a panic seized the christian body and for a while there were far more persons found to compromise their faith 
than to confess it. It seemed as if Aristo's anticipation was justified, that Christianity was losing its hold upon the mind of its subjects, and that nothing more was needed for those who had feared it than to let it die a natural death. And at Sicca the Roman officials, as far as ever they dared, seemed to act on this view. Here Christians did no harm, they made no show, and there was little or nothing in the place to provoke the anger of the mob or to necessitate the interference of the magistrate. The proconsul's absence from Carthage was both an encouragement and an excuse for delay, and hence it was that though we are towards the middle of the year 250, and the edict was published at Rome at its commencement, the good people of Sicca had, as we have said, little knowledge of what was taking place in the political world, and whispered about vague presages of an intended measure which had been in some places in operation for many months communication with the seat of government was not so very frequent or rapid in those days and public curiosity had not been stimulated by the facilities of gratifying it and thus we must account for a phenomenon which we uphold to be a fact in the instance of sicca in the early summer of a d two fifty even though it prove unaccountable and history has nothing to say about it and in spite of the acta diurna the case indeed is different now in these times newspapers railroads and magnetic telegraphs make us independent of government messengers the proceedings at rome would have been generally and accurately known in a few seconds and then by way of urging forward the magistracy a question of course would have been asked in the parliament of carthage by the member for sicca or larabus or thuga or by some one of the pagani or a country party whether the popular report was true that an edict had been promulgated at rome against the christians and what steps had been taken by the local authorities throughout the proconsulate to carry out its provisions and then the colonia sicensis would have presented some good or bad reason for the delay that it arose from the absence of the proconsul from the seat of government or from the unaccountable loss of the dispatch on its way from the coast or perhaps on the other hand the under-secretary would have maintained amid the cheers of his supporters that the edict had been promulgated and carried out at sicca to the full that crowds of christians had at once sacrificed and that in short there was no one to punish assertions which at that moment were too likely to be verified by the event in truth there were many reasons to make the magistrates both roman and native unwilling to proceed in the matter till they were obliged no doubt they one and all detested christianity and would have put it down if they could but the question was when they came to the point what they should put down if indeed they could have got hold of the ringleaders the bishops of the church they would have tortured and smashed them con amore as you would kill a wasp and with the greater warmth and satisfaction just because it was so difficult to get at them those bishops were a set of fellows as mischievous as they were cowardly they would not come out and be killed but they skulked in the desert and hid in masquerade but why should gentlemen in office opulent and happy set about worrying a handful of idiots old or poor or boys or women or obscure or amiable and well-meaning men who were but a remnant of a former generation and as little connected with the fanatics of carthage alexandria or rome as the english freemasons may seem to be with their namesakes on the continent true christianity was a secret society and an illegal religion but would it cease to be so when those harmless or respectable inhabitants of the place had been mounted on the rack or the gibbet and then too it was a most dangerous thing to open the door to popular excitement who would be able to shut it once roused the populace and it was all over with the place it could not be denied that the bigoted and ignorant majority not only of the common people but of the better classes was steeped in a bitter prejudice and an intense though latent hatred of christianity besides the antipathy which arose from the extremely different views of life and duty taken by pagans and christians which would give a natural impulse to persecution in the hearts of the former there were the many persons who wished to curry favour at rome with the government and had an eye to preferment or reward there was the pagan interest extended and powerful of that numerous class which was attached to the established religions by habit position interest or the prospect of advantage 
there were all the great institutions or establishments of the place the law courts the schools of grammar and rhetoric the philosophic exedrae and lecture rooms the theatre and the amphitheatre the market all were for one reason or another opposed to christianity and who could tell where they would stop in their onward course if they were set in motion quieta non movenda was the motto of the local government native and imperial and that the more because it was an age of revolutions and they might be most unpleasantly compromised or embarrassed by the direction which the movement took besides decius was not immortal in the last twelve years eight emperors had been cut off six of them in a few months and who could tell but the successor of the present might revert to the policy of philip and feel no thanks to those who had suddenly left it for a policy of blood in this cautious course they would be powerfully supported by the influence of personal considerations the roman officia the city magistrates the heads of the established religions the lawyers and the philosophers all would have punished the christians if they could but they could not agree whom to punish they would have agreed with great satisfaction as we have said to inflict condign and capital punishment upon the heads of the sect and they would have had no objection if driven to do something to get hold of some strangers or slaves who might be a sort of scapegoats for the rest but it was impossible when they once began to persecute to make distinctions and not a few of them had relations who were christians or at least were on that borderland which the mob might mistake for the domain of christianity martianites tertullianists montanists or gnostics when once the cry of the gods of rome was fairly up it would apply to tolerated religions as well as to illicit and an unhappy votary of isis or mithras might suffer merely because there were a few christians forthcoming a duumvir of the place had a daughter whom he had turned out of his house for receiving baptism and who had taken refuge at bacca several of the decurions the tabularius of the district the scriba one of the exactors who lived in sicca various of the retired gentry whom we spoke of in a former chapter and various attaches of the praetorium were in not dissimilar circumstances nay the priest of esculapius had a wife whom he was very fond of who though she promised to keep quiet if things continued as they were nevertheless had the madness to vow that if there were any severe proceedings instituted against her people she would at once come forward confess herself a christian and throw water instead of incense upon the sacrificial flame not to speak of the venerable man's tenderness for her such an exposure would seriously compromise his respectability and as he was infirm and apoplectic it was a question whether esculapius himself could save him from the shock which would be the consequence the same sort of feeling operated with our good friend jucundus he was attached to his nephew but be it said without disrespect to him he was more attached to his own reputation and while he would have been seriously annoyed at seeing agellius exposed to one of the panthers of the neighbouring forest or hung up by the feet with the blood streaming from his nose and mouth as one of the dogs or kids of the market he would have disliked the eclat of the thing still more he felt both anger and alarm at the prospect he was conscious he did not understand his nephew or to use a common phrase know where to find him he was aware that a great deal of tact was necessary to manage him and he had an instinctive feeling that juba was right in saying that it would not do to threaten him with the utmost severity of the law he considered callista's hold on him was the most promising quarter of the horizon so he came to a resolution to do as little as he could personally but to hold agellius's head as far as he could steadily in the direction of that lady and to see what came of it as to juba's assurance that agellius was not a christian at heart it was too good news to be true but still it might be only an anticipation of what would be when the sun of greece shone out upon him and dispersed the remaining mists of oriental superstition in this state of mind the old gentleman determined one afternoon to leave his shop to the care of a slave and to walk down to his nephew to judge for himself of his state of mind and to bait his hook with callista and to see if agellius bit there was no time to be lost for the publication of the edict might be made any day and then disasters might ensue which no skill could remedy 
End of chapter 7「Eight of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The New Generation. Jucundus then set out to see how the land lay with his nephew, and to do what he could to prosper the tillage. His way led him by the temple of Mercury, which at that time subserved the purpose of a boys' school, and was connected with some academical buildings, the property of the city, which lay beyond it. It cannot be said that our friend was any warm patron of literature or education, though he had not neglected the schooling of his nephews. Letters seemed to him, in fact, to unsettle the mind, and he had never known much good come of them. Rhetoricians and philosophers did not know where they stood or what were their bearings. They did not know what they held and what they did not. He knew his own position perfectly well and though the words belief or knowledge did not come into his religious vocabulary he could at once without hesitation state what he professed and maintained he stood upon the established order of things on the traditions of rome and the laws of the empire but as to greek sophists and declaimers he thought very much as old cato did about them the greeks were a very clever people unrivalled in the fine arts let them keep to their strong point they were inimitable with the chisel the brush the trowel and the fingers but he was not prepared to think much of their calamus or stylus poetry excepted what did they ever do but subvert received principles without substituting any others and then they were so likely to take some odd turn themselves you never could be sure of them socrates their patriarch what was he after all but a culprit a convict who had been obliged to drink hemlock dying under the hands of justice was this a reputable end a respectable commencement of a philosophic family it was very well for plato or xenophon to throw a veil of romance over the transaction but this was the plain matter of fact then anaxagoras had been driven out of athens for his revolutionary notions and diogenes had been accused like the christians of atheism the case had been the same in more recent times there had been that madman apollonius roaming about the world apuleius too their neighbour fifty years before a man of respectable station a gentleman but a follower of the greek philosophy a dabbler in magic and a pretender to miracles and so in fact of letters generally as in their own country minucius a contemporary of apuleius became a christian such too had been his friend octavius such caecilius who even became one of the priests of the sect and seduced others from the religion he had left one of them had been the public talk for several years and he too originally a rhetorician fascius cyprianus of carthage it was the one thing which gave him some misgiving about that little callista that she was a greek as he passed the temple the metal plate was sounding as a signal for the termination of the school and on looking towards the portico with an ill-natured curiosity he saw a young acquaintance of his a youth of about twenty coming out of it leading a boy of about half that age with his satchel thrown over his shoulder well arnobius he cried how does rhetoric proceed are we to take the law line or turn professor who's the boy some younger brother i've taken pity on the little fool answered arnobius these schoolmasters are a savage lot i suffered enough from them myself and miseris sucurure disco so i took him from under the roof of friend rupilius and he's under my tutelage how did he treat the boy he treated me like a slave or a christian answered he he deserved it i'll warrant said jucundus a pert forward imp twas geet against britain much good comes of schooling he's a wicked one already ah the new generation i don't know where the world's going tell the gentleman said arnobius what he did first to you my boy as the good gentleman says 
answered the boy. First I did something to him, and then he did something to me. I told you so, said Jucundus, a sensible boy after all. But the schoolmaster had the best of it, I'll wager. First, answered he, I grinned in his face, and he took off his wooden shoe and <laughs> knocked out one of my teeth. Good, said Jucundus, the justice of Pythagoras. Zaleucus could not have done better. The mouth sins and the mouth suffers next continued he i talked in school time to my chum and rupilius put a gag in my jaws and kept them open for an hour <laughs> the very rhadamanthus of schoolmasters cried jucundus and thereupon you struck up a chant divine though inarticulate like the statue of memnon then said the boy i could not say my virgil and he tore the shirt from off my back and gave it me with the leather ay answered jucundus arma virumque branded on your hide afterwards i ate his dinner for him continued the boy and then he screwed my head and kept me without food for two days your throat you mean said jucundus a cautious man lest you should steal a draught or two of good strong air and lastly said he i did not bring my pence and then he tied my hands to a gibbet and hung me up in terrorum there i came in said arnobius he seemed a pretty boy so i cut him down paid his era and took him home and now he is your pupil asked jucundus not yet answered arnobius he is still a day scholar of the old wolf's one is like another he could not change for the better but I am his bully, and shall tutorize him some day. He's a sharp lad, isn't he, Fermion? Turning to the boy, a great hand at composition for his years, better than I am, who never shall write Latin decently. And what can I do? I must profess and teach, for Rome is the only place for the law, and these city professorships are not to be despised. Whom are you attending here? asked Jucundus dryly. <laughs> you are the only man in sicca who needs to ask the question what not know the great polemo of rhodes the friend of plotinus the pupil of theagenes the disciple of thrasyllus the hearer of nicomachus who was of the school of secundus the doctor of the new pythagoreans not feel the presence in sicca of polemo the most celebrated the most intolerable of men that however is not his title but the godlike or the oracular or the portentous or something else as impressive every one goes to him he is the rage i should not have a chance of success if i could not say that i had attended his lectures though i'd be bound our little fermion here would deliver as good he's the very caryophilus of human nature he comes to the schools in a litter of cedar ornamented with silver and covered with a lion's skin slaves carrying him and a crowd of friends attending with the state of a proconsul he is dressed in the most exact style his pallium is of the finest wool white picked out with purple his tresses flow with unguent his fingers glitter with rings and he smells like idolium as soon as he puts his foot on earth a great hubbub of congratulation and homage breaks forth he takes no notice his favourite pupils form a circle around him and conduct him into one of the exedre till the dial shows the time for the lecture here he sits in silence looking at nothing or at the wall opposite him talking to himself a hum of admiration filling the room presently one of his pupils as if he were a preco to the duumvir cries out hush gentlemen hush the godlike no it is not that i've not got it what is his title the bottomless <laughs> that's it the bottomless speaks a dead silence ensues a clear voice and a measured elocution are the sure token that it is the outpouring of the oracle pray says the little man pray which existed first the egg or the chick did the chick lay the egg or the egg hatch the chick then there ensues a whispering a disputing and after a while a dead silence 
at the end of a quarter of an hour or so our praeco speaks again this time to the oracle bottomless man he says i have to represent to you that no one of the present company finds himself equal to answer the question which your condescension has proposed to our consideration on this there is fresh silence and at length a fresh effatum from the hierophant which comes first the egg or the chick the egg comes first in relation to the causativity of the chick and the chick comes first in relation to the causativity of the egg on which there is a burst of applause the ring of adorers is broken through and the shrinking professor is carried in the arms or on the shoulders of the literary crowd to his chair in the lecture-room much as there was in arnobius's description which gratified jucundus's prejudices he had suspicions of his young acquaintance and was not in the humour to be pleased unreservedly with those who satirised anything whatever that was established or was appointed by government even affectation and pretence he said something about the wisdom of ages the reverence due to authority the institutions of rome and the magistrates of sicca do not go after novelties he said to arnobius make a daily libation to jove the preserver and to the genius of the emperor and then let other things take their course <laughs> but you don't mean i must believe all this man says because the decurians have put him here cried arnobius here is this poloimo saying that proteus is matter and that minerals and vegetables are his flock that proserpine is the vital influence and ceres the efficacy of the heavenly bodies that there are mundane spirits and supramundane and then his doctrine about triads monads and progressions of the celestial gods hm said jucundus they did not say so when i went to school but keep to my rule my boy and swear by the genius of rome and the emperor i don't believe in god or goddess emperor or rome or in any philosophy or in any religion at all said arnobius what cried jucundus you're not going to desert the gods of your ancestors ancestors said arnobius i've no ancestors i'm not african certainly not punic not libophoenician not canaanite not numidian not gatulian i'm half greek but what the other half is i don't know my good old gaffer you're one of the old world i believe nothing who can there is such a racket and whirl of religions on all sides of me that i am sick of the subject ah the rising generation groaned jucundus you young men i cannot prophesy what you will become when we old fellows are removed from the scene perhaps you're a christian arnobius laughed at least i can give you comfort on that head old grandfather a pretty christian i should make indeed seeing visions to be sure and rejoicing in the rack and dungeon i wish to enjoy life i see wealth power rank and pleasure to be worth living for and i see nothing else well said my lad cried jucundus well said stick to that i declare you frightened me give up all visions speculations conjectures fancies novelties discoveries nothing comes of them but confusion no no answered the youth i'm not so wild as you seem to think jucundus it is true i don't believe one single word about the gods but in their worship was i born and in their worship i will die admirable cried jucundus in a transport well i'm surprised you have taken me by surprise you're a fine fellow you're a boy after my heart i've a good mind to adopt you you see i can't believe one syllable of all the priests trash said arnobius who does not they i don't believe in jupiter or juno or in astarte or in isis but where shall i go for anything better or why need i seek anything good or bad in that line nothing's known anywhere and life would go while i attempted what is impossible no better stay where i am i may go further and gain a loss for my pains so you see i am 
for myself and for the genius of rome that's the true principle answered the delighted jucundus why really for so young a man surprising where did you get so much good sense my dear fellow i've seen very little of you well this i'll say you are a youth of most mature mind to be sure well such youths are rare nowadays i congratulate you with all my heart on your strong sense and your admirable wisdom who'd have thought it i've always to tell the truth had a little suspicion of you but you've come out nobly capital i don't wish you to believe in the gods if you can't but it's your duty dear boy your duty to rome to maintain them and to rally round them when attacked then with a changed voice he added ah that a young friend of mine had your view of the matter and then fearing he had said too much he stopped abruptly you mean agellius said arnobius you heard by the by he continued in a lower tone what's the talk in the capital that at rome they are proceeding on a new plan against the christians with great success they don't put to death at least at once they keep in prison and threaten the torture it's surprising how many come over the furies seize them exclaimed jucundus they deserve everything bad always excepting my poor boy so they are cheating the hangman by giving up their atheism the vile reptiles giving in to a threat however added gravely i wish threats would answer with the gellius but i greatly fear that menace would only make him stubborn that stubbornness of a christian oh arnobius he said shaking his head and looking solemn it's a visitation from the gods a sort of nympholepsia it's going out said arnobius mark my words the frenzy is dying it's only wonderful it should have lasted for three centuries the report runs that in some places when the edict was published the christians did not wait for a summons but swept up to the temples to sacrifice like a shoal of tunies the magistrates were obliged to take so many a day and as the days went on none so eager to bring over the rest as those who have already become honest men nay not a few of their mystic or esoteric class have conformed if so unless agellius looks sharp said jucundus his sect will give him up before he gives up his sect christianity will be converted before him oh don't fear for him said arnobius i knew him at school boys differ some are bold and open they like to be men and to dare the deeds of men they talk freely and take their swing in broad day others are shy reserved bashful and are afraid to do what they love quite as much as the others agellius never could rub off this shame and it has taken this turn he's sure to outgrow it in a year or two i should not wonder if when once he had got over it he went into the opposite fault you'll find him a drinker and a swaggerer and a spendthrift before many years are over well that's good news said jucundus i, I mean i'm glad you think he will shake off these fancies i don't believe they sit very close to him myself he walked on for a while in silence then he said uh, that seems a sharp child arnobius could he do me a service if i wanted it does he know agellius know him answered the other yes and his farm too he has rambled round sicca many is the mile and he knows the short cuts and the blind ways and safe circuits what's the boy's name asked jucundus firmian answered arnobius firmian lactantius i say firmian said jucundus to him where are you to be found of a day my boy a class morning and afternoon answered firmian sleeping in the porticoes in midday nowhere in the evening and roosting with arnobius at night and you can keep a secret should it so happen asked jucundus and do an errand if i gave you one i'll give him the stick worse than rupilius if he does not said arnobius a bargain cried jucundus and waving his hand to them he stepped through the city gate and they returned to the afternoon amusements End of chapter 8
Chapter Nine of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Grindus baits his trap. Agellius is busily employed upon his farm while the enemies of his faith are laying their toils for him and his brethren in the imperial city, in the proconsular officium, and in the municipal curia. While Jucundus is scheming against him personally in another way and with other intentions the unconscious object of these machinations is busy about his master's crops housing the corn in caves or pits distilling the roses irrigating the canna and training and sheltering the vines and he does so not only from a sense of duty but the more assiduously because he finds in constant employment a protection against himself against idle thoughts wayward wishes discontent and despondency it is doubtless very strange to the reader how any one who professed himself a christian in good earnest should be open to the imputation of resting his hopes and his heart in the tents of paganism but we do not see why agellius has not quite as much right to be inconsistent in one way as christians of the present time in another and perhaps he has more to say for himself than they they have not had the trial of solitude nor the consequent temptation to which he has been exposed of seeking relief from his own thoughts in the company of unbelievers when a boy he had received his education at that school in the temple of mercury of which we heard in the foregoing chapter and though happily he had preserved himself from the contagion of idolatry and sin he had on that very account formed no friendships with his schoolfellows whether there were any christians there besides himself he did not know but while the worst of his schoolfellows were what heathen boys may be supposed to be the lightest censure which could be passed on any was that they were greedy or quarrelsome or otherwise unamiable he had learned there enough to open his mind and to give him materials for thinking and instruments for reflecting on his own religion and for drawing out into shape his own reflections he had received just that discipline which makes solitude most pleasant to the old and most insupportable to the young he had got a thousand questions which needed answers a thousand feelings which needed sympathy he wanted to know whether his guesses his perplexities his trials of mind were peculiar to himself or how far they were shared by others and what they were worth he had capabilities for intellectual enjoyment unexercised and a thirst after knowledge unsatisfied and the channels of supernatural assistance were removed from him at a time when nature was most impetuous and most clamorous it was under circumstances such as these that the two young greeks brother and sister the brother older and the sister younger than agellius came to sicca at the invitation of eucundus who wanted them for his trade his nephew in time got acquainted with them and found in them what he had sought in vain elsewhere it is not that they were oracles of wisdom or repositories of philosophical learning their age and their calling forbade it nor did he require it for an oracle of course he would have looked in another direction but he desiderated something more on a level with himself and that they abundantly supplied he found from his conversations with them that a great number of the questions which had been a difficulty to him had already been agitated in the schools of greece he found what solutions were possible what the hinge was on which questions turned what the issue to which they led and what the principle which lay at the bottom of them he began better to understand the position of christianity in the world of thought and the view which was taken of it by the advocates of other religions or philosophies he gained some insight into its logic and advanced without knowing it in the investigation of its evidences nor was this all he acquired by means of his new friends a great deal also of secular knowledge as well as philosophical he learnt much of the history of foreign countries especially of greece of its heroes and sages its poets and its statesmen of alexander of the syro macedonic empire of the jews and of the series of conquests through which rome advanced to universal dominion to impart knowledge is as interesting as to acquire it and agellius was called upon to give as well as to take the brother and sister without showing any great religious earnestness were curious to know about christianity 
and listened with the more patience that they had no special attachment to any other worship in the debates which ensued though there was no agreement there was the pleasure of mental exercise and excitement he found enough to tell them without touching upon the more sacred mysteries and while he never felt his personal faith at all endangered by their free conversation his charity or at least his good will and his gratitude led him to hope or even to think that they were in the way of conversion themselves in this thought he was aided by his own innocence and simplicity and though on looking back afterwards to this eventful season he recognized many trivial occurrences which ought to have put him on his guard yet he had no suspicion at the time that those who conversed so winningly and sustained so gracefully and happily the commerce of thought and sentiment might in their actual state nay in their governing principles be an utter contrariety to himself when the veil was removed from off their hearts nor was it in serious matters alone but still more on lighter occasions of intercourse that aristo and callista were attractive to the solitary agellius she had a sweet thrilling voice and accompanied herself on the lyre she could act the improvisatress and her expressive features were a running commentary on the varied meaning the sunshine and the shade of her ode or her epic she could relate how the profane pentheus and the self-glorious hippolytus gave a lesson to the world of the feebleness of human virtue when it placed itself in opposition to divine power she could teach how the chaste diana manifests herself to the simple shepherd endymion not to the great or learned and how tithonus the spouse of the morn adumbrates the fate of those who revel in their youth as if it were to last for ever and who when old do nothing but talk of the days when they were young wearying others with tales of their amours or their exploits like grasshoppers that show their vigour only by their chirping the very allegories which sickened and irritated arnobius when spouted out by polemo touched the very chords of poor agellius's heart when breathed forth from the lips of the beautiful greek she could act also and suddenly when conversation flagged or suggested it she could throw herself into the part of medea or antigone with a force and truth which far surpassed the effect produced by the male and masked representations of those characters at the theatre brother and sister were oedipus and antigone electra and orestes cassandra and the chorus once or twice they attempted a scene in menander but there was something which made agellius shrink from the comedy beautiful as it was and clever as was the representation callista could act theus as truly as iphigenia but agellius could not listen as composedly there are certain most delicate instincts and perceptions in us which act as first principles and which once effaced can never except from some supernatural source be restored to the mind when men are in a state of nature these are sinned against and vanish very soon at so early a date in the history of the individual that perhaps he does not recollect that he ever possessed them and since like other first principles they are but very partially capable of proof a general scepticism prevails both as to their existence and their truth the greeks partly from the vivacity of their intellect partly from their passion for the beautiful lost these celestial adumbrations sooner than other nations when a collision arose on such matters between agellius and his friends callista kept silence but aristo was not slow to express his wonder that the young christian should think customs or practices wrong which in his view of the matter were as unblameable and natural as eating drinking or sleeping his own face became almost satirical as agellius's became grave however he was too companionable and good-natured to force another to be happy in his own way he imputed to the extravagance of his friend's religion what in any but a christian he would have called moroseness and misanthropy and he bade his sister give over representations which instead of enlivening the passing hour did but inflict pain this friendly intercourse had now gone on for some months as the leisure of both parties admitted once or twice brother and sister had come to the suburban farm but for the most part in spite of his intense dislike of the city he had for their sake 
threaded its crowded and narrow thoroughfares crossed its open places and presented himself at their apartments and was it very strange that a youth so utterly ignorant of the world and unsuspicious of evil should not have heard the warning voice which called him to separate himself from heathenism even in its most specious form was it very strange under these circumstances that a sanguine hope the hope of the youthful should have led agellius to overlook obstacles and beguile himself into the notion that callista might be converted and make a good christian wife well we have nothing more to say for him if we have not already succeeded in extenuating his offence we must leave him to the mercy or rather to the justice of his severely virtuous censors but all this while eucundus had been conversing with him and unless we are quick about it we shall lose several particulars which are necessary for those who wish to pursue without a break the thread of his history his uncle had brought the conversation round to the delicate point which had occasioned his visit and had just broken the ice with greater tact and more ample poetical resources than we should have given him credit for he had been led from the scene before him to those prospects of a moral and social character which ought soon to employ the thoughts of his dear agellius he had spoken of vines and of their culture apropos of the dwarf vines around him which stood about the height of a currant bush thence he had proceeded to the subject of the more common vine of africa which crept and crawled along the ground the extremity of each plant resting in succession on the stalk of that which immediately preceded it and now being well into his subject he called to mind the high vine of italy which mounts by the support of the slim tree to which it clings then he quoted horace on the subject of the marriage of the elm and the vine this lodged him in medias res and agellius heart beat when he found his uncle proposing to him as a thought of his own the very step which he had fancied was almost a secret of his own breast though juba had seemed to have some suspicion of it my dear agellius said jucundus it would be a most suitable proceeding i have never taken to marrying myself it has not lain in my way or been to my taste your father did not set me an encouraging example but here you are living by yourself in this odd fashion unlike any one else perhaps you may come in time and live in sicca we shall find some way of employing you and it will be pleasant to have you near me as i get old however i mean it to be some time yet before charon makes a prize of me not that i believe all that rubbish more than you agellius i assure you it strikes me agellius began that perhaps you may think it inconsistent in me taking such a step but ay ay that's the rub thought jucundus then aloud inconsistent my boy who talks of inconsistency what superfine jackanapes dares to call it inconsistent you seem made for each other agellius she town you country she so clever and attractive and up to the world you so fresh and arcadian you'll be quite the talk of the place that's just what i don't want to be said agellius i mean to say he continued that if i thought it inconsistent with my religion to think of callista oh of course of course interrupted his uncle who took his cue from juba and was afraid of the workings of agellius's human respect but who knows you have been a christian no one knows anything about it i'll be bound they all think you an honest fellow like themselves a worshipper of the gods without crotchets or hobbies of any kind i never told them to the contrary my opinion is that if you were to make your libation to jove and throw incense upon the imperial altar to-morrow no one would think it extraordinary they would say for certain that they had seen you do it again and again don't fancy for an instant my dear agellius that you have anything whatever to get over agellius was getting awkward and mortified as may be easily conceived and jucundus saw it but could not make out why my dear uncle said the youth you are reproaching me not a bit of it said jucundus confidently not a shadow of reproach why should i reproach you we can't be wise all at once 
I had my follies once, as you may have had yours. It's natural you should grow more attached to things as they are. Things as they are, you know, as time goes on. Marriage and the preparation for marriage sobers a man. You've been a little headstrong, I can't deny, and had your fling in your own way. But nuces pueris, as you will soon be saying yourself on a certain occasion, your next business is to consider what kind of a marriage you propose. I suppose the Roman, but there is great room for choice even there. It is a proverb how different things are in theory and when reduced to practice. Agellius had thought of the end more than of the means, and had had a vision of Callista as a Christian when the question of rites and forms would have been answered by the decision of the church without his trouble. He was somewhat sobered by the question, though in a different way from what his uncle wished and intended. Eucundus proceeded. First, there is matrimonium confariationis. You have nothing to do with that. Strictly speaking, it is obsolete. It went out with the exclusiveness of the old patricians. I say, strictly speaking, for the ceremonies remain, waiving the formal religious rite. Well, my dear Agellius, I don't recommend this ceremonial to you. You'd have to kill a porker to take out the entrails, to put away the gall, and to present it to Juno Pronuba. And there's fire, too, and water, and frankincense, and a great deal of the same kind, which I think undesirable, and you would, too. For there, I am sure, we are agreed. We put this aside, then, the religious marriage. Then comes the marriage ex coemptione, a sort of mercantile transaction. In this case, the parties buy each other and become each other's property. Well, every man to his taste, but for me, I don't like to be bought and sold. I like to be my own master, and am suspicious of anything irrevocable. Why should you commit yourself, do you see, for ever, for ever, to a girl you know so little of? Don't look surprised. It's common sense. It's very well to buy her, but to be bought, that's quite another matter. And I don't know that you can. Uh, being a Roman citizen yourself, you can only make a marriage with a citizen. Now the question is whether Callista is a citizen at all. I know perfectly well the sweeping measure some years back of Caracalla, which made all free men citizens of Rome, whatever might be their country. But that measure has never been carried out, in fact. You'd have very great difficulty with the law and customs of the country. And then, after all, if the world were willing to gratify you, uh, where's your proof? She is a free woman. My dear boy, I must speak out for your good, though you're offended with me. I wish you to have her. I do. But you can't do impossibilities you can't alter facts the laws of the empire allow you to have her in a certain definite way and no other and you cannot help the law being what it is i say all this even on the supposition of her being a free woman but it is just possible she may be in law a slave uh, don't start in that way the pretty thing is neither better nor worse for what she cannot help say it for your good well now i'm coming to my point <sighs> there is a third kind of marriage and that is what i should recommend for you it's the matrimonium ex usu or consuetudine the great advantage here is that you have no ceremonies whatever nothing which can in any way startle your sensitive mind in that case a couple are at length man and wife prescriptione you are afraid of making a stir in sicca in this case you would make none you would simply take her home here if as time went on you got on well together it would be a marriage if not and he shrugged his shoulders no harm's done you are both free agellius had been sitting on a gate of one of the vineyards he started on his feet threw up his arms and made an exclamation uh, listen listen my dear boy cried eucundus hastening to explain what he considered the cause of his sudden annoyance listen just one moment agellius if you can dear dear how i wish i knew where to find you what is the matter 
I'm not treating her ill. I'm not, indeed. I have not had any notion at all, even of hinting, that you should leave her, unless you both wished the bargain rescinded. No, but it is a great rise for her. You are a Roman, with property, with position in the place. She's a stranger, and without a dower. Nobody knows whence she came, or anything about her. She ought to have no difficulty about it, and I am confident we'll have none. Oh, my dear good uncle, oh, Jucundus! Jucundus, cried Agellius, is it possible? Do my ears hear right? What is it you ask me to do? And he burst into tears. Is it conceivable, he said with energy, that you are in earnest in recommending me, I say, in recommending me a marriage which really would be no marriage at all? here is some very great mistake said jucundus angrily it arises agellius from your ignorance of the world you must be thinking i recommend you mere contubernium as the lawyers call it well i confess i did think of that for a moment it occurred to me i should have liked to have mentioned it but knowing how preposterously touchy and skittish you are on supposed points of honour or sentiment or romance or of something or other indescribable i said not one word about that i have only wished to consult for your comfort present and future you don't do me justice agellius i have been attempting to smooth your way you must act according to the received usages of society you cannot make a world for yourself here have i proposed three or four ways for your proceeding and you will have none of them what will you have i thought you didn't like ceremonies i thought you did not like the established ways go then do it in the old-fashioned kill your sheep knead your meal light your torches sing your song summon your flamen if you'll come anyhow take your choice do it either with religion or without oh eucundus said the poor fellow am i then come to this and he could say no more his distress was not greater than his uncle's disappointment perplexity and annoyance the latter had been making everything easy for agellius and he was striking do what he would on hidden inexplicable impediments whichever way he moved he got more and more angry the more he thought about it an unreasonable irrational coxcomb he had heard a great deal of the portentous stubbornness of a christian and now he understood what it was it was in his blood he saw an offensive sour humour tainting him from head to foot a very different recompense had he deserved there had he come all the way from his home from purely disinterested feelings he had no motive whatever but a simple desire of his nephew's welfare what other motive could he have let agellius go to the crows he thought if he will what is it to me if he is seized for a christian hung up like a dog or thrown like a dead rat into the cloaca of the prison what care i if he is made a hyena's breakfast in the amphitheatre all sick of looking on or if he is nailed on a cross for the birds to peck at before my door ungrateful puppy it is no earthly concern of mine what becomes of him i shall be neither better nor worse no one will say a word against eucundus he will not lose a single customer or be shunned by a single jolly companion for the exposure of his nephew but a man can't be saved against his will here am i full of expedients and resources for his good there is he throwing cold water on everything and making difficulties as if he loved them it's his abominable pride that's the pith of the matter he could not have behaved worse though i had played the bully with him and had reproached him with his christianity but i have studiously avoided every subject which could put his back up he's a very typhon or enceladus for pride here he'd give his ears to have done with christianity he wants to have this callista he wants to buy her at the price of his religion but he'd rather be burned than say i've changed let him reap as he has sown why should i coax him further to be merciful to himself oh well 
agellius he said aloud i am going back agellius on the other hand had his own thoughts and the most urgent of them at the moment was sorrow that he had hurt his uncle he was sincerely attached to him in consequence of his faithful guardianship his many acts of kindness the reminiscences of childhood nay the love he bore to the good points of his character to him he owed his education and his respectable position he could not bear his anger and he had a fear of his authority but what was to be done jucundus in utter insensibility to certain instincts and rules which in christianity are first principles had without intending it been greatly dishonouring agellius and his passion and the object of it uncle and nephew had been treading on each other's toes and each was wincing under the mischance it was agellius's place as the younger to make advances if he could to the adjustment of the misunderstanding and he wished to find some middle way and also it is evident he had another inducement besides his tenderness to jucundus to urge him to do so in truth callista exerted a tremendous sway over him the conversation which had just passed ought to have opened his eyes and made him understand that the very first step in any negotiations between them was her bona fide conversion it was evident he could not he literally had not the power of marrying her as a heathen roman might marry a roman but a degradation of each party in the transaction was the only way by which a roman could make any sort of marriage with a greek if she were converted they would be both of them under the rules of the catholic church but what prospect was there of so happy an event what had ever fallen from her lips which looked that way could not a clever girl throw herself into the part of alcestes or chant the majestic verses of cleanthes or extemporize a hymn upon the spring or hold an argument on the pulchrum and utile without having any leaning towards christianity a calm sweet voice a noble air an expressive countenance refined and decorous manners were these specific indications of heavenly grace ah poor agellius a fascination is upon you and so you are thinking of some middle term which is to reconcile your uncle and you and therefore you begin as follows i see by your silence jucundus that you are displeased with me you who are always so kind well it comes from my ignorance of things it does indeed i ask your forgiveness for anything which seemed ungrateful in my behaviour though there is not ingratitude in my heart i am too much of a boy to see things beforehand and to see them in all their bearings you took me by surprise by talking on the subject which led to our misunderstanding i will not conceal for an instant that i like callista very much and that the more i see her i like her the more it strikes me that if you break the matter to aristo he and i might have some talk together and understand each other jucundus was hot-tempered but easily pacified and he really did wish to be on confidential terms with his nephew at the present crisis so he caught at his apology now you speak like a reasonable fellow agellius he answered certainly i will speak to aristo as you wish and on this question of consuetudo or prescription well don't begin looking queer again i will i mean i will speak to him on the whole question and its details he and i will talk together for our respective principles we shall soon come to terms i warrant you and then you shall talk with him come uh, show me round your fields he continued and let me see how you will be able to present things to your bride a very pretty property it is i it was who was the means of your father thinking of it you have heard me say so before now and all the circumstances he was at carthage at this time undecided what to do with himself it so happened that julia clara's estates were just then in the market an enormous windfall her estates were old didius was emperor just before my time he gave all his estates to his daughter as soon as he assumed the purple poor lady she did not enjoy them long severus confiscated the whole 
not, however, for the benefit of the state, but of the res privata. They are so large in Africa alone, that, as you know, you are under a special procurator. Well, they did not come into the market at once. The existing farmers were retained. Marcus Juventius farmed a very considerable portion of them. They were contiguous and dovetailed into his own lands, and accordingly when he got into trouble and had to sell his leases, there were certain odds and ends about Sicca which it was proposed to lease piecemeal. Your employer, Varius, would have given any money for them, but I was beforehand with him. Nothing like being on the spot. He was on business of the proconsul at Adrumatum. I sent off Hispa instantly to Strabo, not an hour's delay after I heard of it. The sale was at Carthage. He went to his old commander, who used his influence, and the thing was done. I venture to say there's not such a snug little farm in all Africa, and I am sanguine we shall get a renewal, though Varius will do his utmost to outbid us. Ah, my dear Agellius, if there is but a suspicion you are not a thorough-going Roman. Well, well, here, ease me through this gate, Agellius. I don't know what's come to the gate since I was here. Indeed. Yes, you have improved this very much. That small arbor is delicious. But you want an image, an Apollo or a Diana. Ah, do now. Stop for a moment. Why are you going forward at such a pace? I'll give you an image. It shall be one that you will really like. Well, you won't have it. I beg you ten thousand pardons. Oh, I mean nothing. Oh, what an odd world it is. Oh, well, I am keeping you from your laborers. And having thus smoothed his own ruffled temper and set things right, as he considered, with Agellius, the old pagan took his journey homewards assuring agellius that he would make all things clear for him in a very short time and telling him to be sure to make a call upon aristo before the ensuing calends end of chapter nine chapter ten of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain the divine callista the day came which agellius had fixed for paying his promised visit to aristo it is not to be denied that in the interval the difficulties of the business which occasioned his visit had increased upon his apprehensions callista was not yet a christian nor was there any reason for saying that a proposal of marriage would make her one and a strange sort of convert she would be if it did he would not suffer himself to dwell upon difficulties, which he was determined never should be realized. No, of course, a heathen he could not marry, but a heathen Callista should not be. He did not see the process, but he was convinced she would become a Christian. Yet somehow so it was that if he was able to stultify his reason, he did not quite succeed to his satisfaction with his conscience every morning found him less satisfied with himself and more disposed to repent of having allowed his uncle to enter on the subject with aristo but it was a thing done and over he must either awkwardly back out or he must go on his middle term as he hastily had considered it was nothing else than siding with his uncle and committing himself to go all lengths unless some difficulty rose with the other party yet could he really wish that the step had not been taken was it not plain that if he was to put away callista from his affections he must never go near her and was he to fall back on his drear solitude and lose that outlet of thought and relief of mind which he had lately found in the society of his greek friends we may easily believe that he was not very peaceful in heart when he set out on that morning to call upon aristo yet he would not allow that he was doing wrong he recurred to the pleasant imagination that callista would certainly become a christian and dwelt pertinaciously upon it he could not tell on what it was founded he knew enough of his religion not to mean that she was too good to be a heathen so it is to be supposed he meant that he discerned what he hoped were traces of some supernatural influence operating upon her mind he had a perception which he could not justify by argument 
that there was in Callista a promise of something higher than anything she yet was. He felt a strange sympathy with her, which certainly, unless he utterly deceived himself, was not based on anything merely natural or human, a sympathy the more remarkable from the contrariety which existed between them in matters of religious belief and hope having blown this large and splendid bubble sent it sailing away and it rose upon the buoyant atmosphere of youth beautiful to behold and yet as agellius ascended the long flight of marble steps which led the foot passenger up into that fair city while the morning sun was glancing across them and surveyed the outline of the many sumptuous buildings which crested and encircled the hill did he not know full well that iniquity was written on its very walls and spoke a solemn warning to a christian heart to go out of it to flee it not to take up a home in it not to make alliance with anything in it did he not know from experience full well that when he got into it his glance could no longer be unrestrained or his air free but that it would be necessary for him to keep a control upon his senses and painfully guard himself against what must either be a terror to him and an abhorrence or a temptation enter in imagination into a town like sicca and you will understand the great apostle's anguish at seeing a noble and beautiful city given up to idolatry enter it and you will understand why it was that the poor priest of whom jucundus spoke so bitterly hung his head and walked with timid eyes and clouded brow through the joyous streets of carthage hitherto we have only been conducting heathens through it boys or men jucundus arnobius and firmian but now a christian enters it with a christian's heart and a christian's hope well is it for us dear reader that we in this age do not experience nay a blessed thing that we cannot even frame to ourselves in imagination the actual details of evil which hung as an atmosphere over the cities of pagan rome an apostle calls the tongue a fire a world of iniquity untamable a restless evil a deadly poison and surely what he says applies to hideous thoughts represented to the eye as well as when they are made to strike upon the ear unfortunate agellius what takes you into the city this morning doubtless some urgent compulsive duty otherwise you would not surely be threading its lanes or taking the circuit of its porticoes amid sights which now shock and now allure fearful sights not here and there but on the stateliest structures and in the meanest hovels in public offices and private houses in central spots and at the corners of the streets in bazaars and shops and house doors in the rudest workmanship and in the highest art in letters or in emblems or in paintings the insignia and the pomp of satan and of belial of a reign of corruption and a revel of idolatry which you can neither endure nor escape wherever you go it is all the same in the police court on the right in the military station on the left in the crowd around the temple in the procession with its victims and its worshippers who walk to music in the language of the noisy market people wherever you go you are accosted confronted publicly shamelessly now as if a precept of religion now as if a homage to nature by all which as a christian you shrink from and abjure it is no accident of the season or of a day it is the continuous tradition of some thousands of years it is the very orthodoxy of the myriads who have lived and died there there was a region once in an early age lying upon the eastern sea which is said at length to have vomited out its inhabitants for their frightful iniquity they thus cast forth took ship and passed over to the southern coast and then gradually settling and spreading into the interior they peopled the woody plains and fertile slopes of africa and filled it with their cities sicca is one of these set up in sin and at the time of which we write that sin was basking under the sun and rioting and extending itself to its amplest dimensions like some glittering serpent or spotted pard of the neighbourhood 
without interposition from heaven or earth in correction of so awful a degradation in such scenes of unspeakable pollution our christian forefathers perforce lived through such a scene though not taking part in it agellius blessed with a country home is unnecessarily passing he has reached the house or rather the floor to which he has been making his way it is at the back of the city where the rock is steep and it looks out upon the plain and the mountain range to the north its inmates aristo and callista are engaged in their ordinary work of moulding or carving painting or gilding the various articles which the temples or the private shrines of the established religion required aristo has received from jucundus the overtures which agellius had commissioned him to make and finds as he anticipated that they are no great news to his sister she perfectly understands what is going on but does not care to speak much upon it till agellius makes his appearance as they sit at work aristo speaks agellius will make his appearance here this morning i say callista what can he be coming for why if your news be true that the christians are coming into trouble of course he means to purchase as a blessing on him some of these bits of gods you are sharp enough my little sister answered aristo to know perfectly well who is the goddess he is desirous of purchasing callista laughed carelessly but made no reply come child aristo continued don't be cruel to him wreath a garland for him by the time he comes he's well to do and modest withal and needs encouragement he's well enough said callista i say he's a fellow too well off to be despised as a lover proceeded her brother and it would be a merit with the gods to rid him of his superstition not much of a christian she made answer if he is set upon me for whose sake has he been coming here so often mine or yours callista i am tired of such engagements she replied she went on with her painting and several times seemed as if she would have spoken but did not then without interrupting her work she said calmly time was it gratified my conceit and my feelings to have hangers-on indeed without them how should we have had means to come here but there's a weariness in all things a weariness where is this bad humour to end cried aristo it has been a long fit shake it off while you can or it will be too much for you what can you mean a weariness you are over young to bid youth farewell aching hearts for aching bones so young and so perverse we must take things as the gods give them you will ask for them in vain when you are old one day above another day beneath one while young another while old enjoy life while you have it in your hand he said this as he worked then he stopped and turned round to her with his graving tool in his hand recollect old lesbia how she used to squeak out to me with her nodding head and trembling limbs here he mimicked the old crone my boy take your pleasure while you can i can't take pleasure my day is over but i don't reproach myself i had a merry time of it while it lasted time stops for no one but i did my best i don't reproach myself there's the true philosopher though a slave more outspoken than aesop more practical than epictetus callista began singing to herself i wander by that river's brink which circles pluto's drear domain i feel the chill night breeze and think of joys which ne'er shall be again i count the weeds that fringe the shore 
each sluggish wave that rolls and rolls i hear the ever splashing oar of charon ferryman of souls hey ho she continued little regret but much dread the young have to fear more than the old have to mourn over the future outweighs the past life is not so sweet as death is bitter it is hard to quit the light the light of heaven Calistidion, he said impatiently my girl this is preposterous how long is this to go on we must take you to carthage there is more trade there if we can get it and it will be on the bright far resounding sea and i will turn rhetorician and you shall feed my classes oh beautiful divine light she continued what a loss oh to think that one day i must lose you for ever at home i used to lie awake at night longing for the morning and crying out for the god of day it was like choice wine to me a cup of shian the first streaks of the aurora and i could hardly bear his bright coming when he came to me like semele for rapture how gloriously did he shoot over the hills and then anon he rested a while on the snowy summit of olympus as in some luminous shrine gladdening the phrygian plain fair bright-haired god thou art my worship if callista worships aught but somehow i worship nothing now i am weary well said her brother in a soothing tone it is a change that light elastic air that transparent heaven that fresh temperate breeze that majestic sea africa is not greece oh the difference that's it callista it's the nostalgia you are homesick it may be so she said i do not well know what i would have yes the poisonous dews the heavy heat the hideous beasts the green fever gendering swamps this vast thickly wooded plain like some mysterious labyrinth oppresses and disquiets me with its very richness the luxuriant foliage tall rank plants the deep close lanes i do not see my way through them and i pant for breath i only breathe freely on this hill oh how unlike greece with the clear soft delicate colouring of its mountains and the pure azure or the purple of its waters but my dear callista interrupted her brother recollect you are not in those oppressive gloomy forests but in sicca and no one asks you to penetrate them and if you want mountains i think those on the horizon are bare enough and the race of man she continued is worse than all where is the genius of our bright land where is its intelligence playfulness grace and noble bearing here hearts are as black as brows and smiles as treacherous as the adders of the wood the natives are crafty and remorseless they never relax they have no cheerfulness or mirth their very love is a furnace and their sole ecstasy is revenge no country like home to any of us said aristo and yet here you are habit would be a second nature if you were here long enough your feelings would become acclimated and would find a new home people get to like the darkness of the extreme north in course of time the painted britons the cimmerians the hyperboreans are content never to see the sun at all 
which is your god here your own god reigns why quarrel with him the son of greece is light answered callista the son of africa is fire i am no fire worshipper i suspect even styx and phlegethon are tolerable at length said her brother if phlegethon and styx there be as the poets tell us the cold foggy styx is the north said callista and the south is the scorching blasting phlegethon and greece clear sweet and sunny is the elysian fields and she continued her improvisations where are the islands of the blest they stud the aegean sea and where the deep elysian rest it haunts the vale where Peneus strong pours his incessant stream along while craggy ridge and mountain bare cut keenly through the liquid air and in their own pure tints arrayed scorn earth's green robes which change and fade and stand in beauty undecayed guards of the bold and free <laughs> a lower flight if you please just now said aristo interrupting her i do really wish a serious word with you about agellius he's a fellow i can't help liking in spite of his misanthropy let me plead his cause like him or not yourself still he has a full purse and you will do a service to yourself and to the gods of greece and to him too if you will smile on him smile on him at least for a time we will go to carthage when you are tired his looks have very little in them of a christian left you may blow it away with your breath one might do worse than be a christian she answered slowly if all is true that i have heard of them aristo started up in irritation by all the gods of olympus he said this is intolerable if a man wants a tormentor i commend him to a girl like you what has ailed thee some time past you silly child what have i done to you that you should have got so cross and contrary and so hard to please i mean she said if i were a christian life would be more bearable bearable he echoed bearable ye gods more bearable to have sticks and tartarus the furies and their snakes in this world as well as in the next to have evil within and without to hate one's self and to be hated of all men to live the life of an ass and to die the death of a dog bearable but hark i hear agellius step on the staircase callista dear callista be yourself listen to reason but callista would not listen to reason if her brother was its embodiment but went on with her singing for oh, what is afric but the home of burning phlegethon what the low beach and silent gloom and chilling mists of that dull river along whose bank the thin ghosts shiver the thin wan ghosts that once were men but Taurus, isle of moor and fen or dimly traced by seamen's ken the pale clift albion here she stopped looked down and busied herself with her work End of chapter ten